Okay. Keefley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Yeah, that was, that was, that was pretty fun. That was, a nice little, uh, that was a nice little teaser right there. Eric worked really hard on all those teasers last night and liners, so <laughs> we, we appreciate that. And, and they got a little bit more bizarre the later in the evening it went, or yeah. earlier in the morning oh, it went. Oh, you heard that one, huh? You liked that one. That was uh, it was pretty fun. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there was some crazy stuff in there, and he sent me a few, and I'm like, nope, 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 yep, nope, yep, nope. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of good stuff. Uh, so Brad Keithley joins us. Brad, thanks for coming on the program uh, and your inaugural Tuesday here on the broadcast. We appreciate you being part of it. Lots of good stuff to talk about today. Uh, let's start off, I guess, with the uh, with the economy. The ADN saying, um, "Don't worry, the uh, the economic crisis is over." Well, I wish that were the case. Um, I follow uh, the ADN story is really built around jobs, which is one indicator of the economy and an indicator that that uh, Neil Freed and some of the people in the Department of Labor uh, rely on. But there are other indicators out there. Uh, uh, one is gross state product, which is a, a, a measure of how much the state is producing in goods and services. Uh, another is income, uh, how much Alaskans are receiving an income uh, from very, from all sources. And if you look at at all of those measures, uh, I don't. I, I think it's I think it's premature to say that we're that we're moving ourselves out of the. Uh, out of the recession. Jobs uh, are still declining. Uh, we're still losing jobs. Uh, GSP, gross state product, uh, adjusted for inflation is stagnant, uh, even with uh, the increase uh, uh, in oil prices from the, from the lows. So that means that those increases in oil prices, increases in oil value are being offset by, by drops elsewhere in the economy. Income, uh, inflation-adjusted income, uh, is um, uh, pretty uh, 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 is still in decline uh, uh, quarter on quarter. We're probably back somewhere at the 2014 level uh, in terms of inflation-adjusted income. We're back at the 2008 level uh, in terms of inflation-adjusted gross state product. So uh, it's I. I we, we may be stabilizing a little bit, uh, but uh, it's it's still uh, we're still in a in a in a decline. Uh, probably not as rapid a decline as we've ex- as we've experienced since uh, 2014, since oil prices started to drop. Uh, but we're still in a decline. Well, and I, and I think that was the important part here to when I took a look at this and. Uh, like you said, I think you said in an email to me or a message to me that basically said it depends on what a co- you know what what uh, 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 category or industry that you're in, uh, because I think a lot of us are still feeling the pain. I know retail is definitely struggling. I, I've had dealings with them, uh, you know, with that sector for a long time in, in advertising sales and everything else, and and they're all very much still in the struggling part of the of the recession. Um, and I think Freed, in the end of this article, really kind of makes the, the biggest point to say, you know, the, the end of a recession and recovery are two completely different things, and, and we really need to pay attention to that. They are, and I don't, and I don't think we're at the end of the recession yet. I guess what, yeah. I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is we may be slowing down uh, at the rate at which we're, we're declining, but I don't think we've seen uh, the end of the recession yet. There are two – it, it does depend on where you sit. Uh, there are two parts of the economy uh, that are doing okay, better than other parts of the economy. One is the health sector. Uh, we actually have had an in- increase in employment. Right. Uh, and if you look at it on a sector basis, an increase in income uh, in the health sector. And part of that is being is is the result of the state having accepted uh, expanded Medicaid or expanded Medicare. Medicaid expanded Medicaid uh, <laughs> under uh, uh, under President Obama, and uh, and so that injected additional dollars, federal dollars, uh, into the state. And 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 as we have a a an aging population, that has had the effect of injecting additional dollars into the medical uh, into the health sector. So that sector is doing okay, 
And surprisingly, and, and I'm not sure how long this lasts, but surprisingly, local government is doing okay. If you look at jobs and you look at income levels uh, by sector, local government is is staying relatively stable. Uh, which and, and and local government includes the school systems, uh, the local school systems. So it it seems that um, it seems that that sector is doing okay. But frankly, I think that probably. Uh, is sort of a false uh, economy. A lot of that economy is driven by state government spending, both in terms of support for education and in terms of subsidies for local construction budgets related to uh, related to uh, local government. And and we are likely seeing real, I mean, decline in terms of real dollars. Not uh, not not current uh, nominal dollars, but but inflation adjusted dollars. We're likely going to continue to see a decline in that, and I think that's probably going to eat into the local government sector as well. So I, looking at all the numbers, uh, uh, I, I think we're we're continuing uh, overall to, to 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 continuing into into recession uh, in the state. Uh, as I say, it may be lessening the, the speed at which we're going down, uh, may be lessening, but but nonetheless, we continue to overall, we continue to uh, to be in decline. Well, and, and I look at this, I mean, you talk about local governments, uh, you know, remaining fa- fairly flat. I mean, I guess unless you're the municipality where they're, they've seen an increase of another $20 million and, and again, another record high. It's almost like some of these municipalities and some of these local governments don't realize that there's a crisis on, don't realize that there's a, you know, an economic downturn and, uh, and it's just kind of business as usual. And, and that to me is the most troubling. Uh, we're even seeing that kind of attitude in the state in a lot of ways. Well, we've got to have the money because we've got to have these services and you've got to pay for it regardless of what the effect is on the private economy. And, uh, and that's where we're at right now. I mean, Harold says in the chat room, he goes, I'm not buying the sectional we want. Our daughter isn't buying her truck. Consumer spending is in decline. That's a that's a real canary in the coal mine for all this stuff. It is, and and part of what's driving part of what's driving that is is the PFD. I mean, we've taken uh, seven hundred fifty million dollars. By the time you gross it up by the by the the, the knock on effect or the the multiplier effect, we're taking about a billion dollars out of the out of the out of the economy through uh, PFD cuts, and and it's been. I mean, one could argue it's been redeployed. Um, uh, it's the the PFD itself has stayed in the earnings reserve, but they've spent out of the constitutional budget reserve, and they would argue that they've done that uh, uh, because they put stuff into the earnings reserve. Um, it's been redeployed by government, but it's not going in the same sectors uh, as as it would if it went out in the PFD. And so you've got uh, you've got the retail sector, which is you know not. Not entirely driven by the PFD by a large stretch of the imagination, but but is significantly affected by the PFD. Uh, when you cut, you know, 750 million dollars, a billion dollars out of the out of you know consumer spending, you're going to have a hit on the retail sector. And I, and we're a couple of years into this in terms of PFD cuts, but I think I think the strategy of most businesses is they start to see a downturn, and they try to hang on. I mean, we've seen that to some degree in the restaurant sector. Uh, right. In the state, you start to see a downturn, but you think it's going to be temporary. You try to hang on for a bit. You uh, you know you continue. You, you may cut employment a little bit, but you try to continue on. And now that we're in the second year of PFD cuts, I think people in the retail sector just sort of you know, yes, this is now going to be a, a big effect, and we're seeing uh, we're seeing the cutbacks in that. So it's um, we're not out of this, and we're doing things to go back to. A theme you and I touch on often. We're doing things that make it worse. ICER has said the largest adverse effect on the overall economy, uh, both jobs and uh, income, of all of the new revenue measures the state can take, largest adverse impact comes from uh, cutting the PFD. By far, the worst impact on Alaska families comes from cutting the PFD. We've done that now two years in a row. It's having its effect. I mean, we're we're seeing the economy continuing to go down. Well, and I think that's, you know, that's the problem that it keeps being ignored by our local politicians is that 
uh, or not our local, but our state politicians, is the economy continues to go down, yet they continue to beat the same drum, which, of course, is we need more revenue. Shelly Hughes has got this article out that basically points some of the, you know, put some holes in this whole we've cut all we can cut kind of argument. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that that's the, that's the battle cry we need to be taking up that cuts still need to occur, that we need to live within our means in government just like the rest of us in the private economy uh, are doing and, uh, and are, and are uh, you know, having to do through no choice of our own. I mean, Eric and I were joking this morning. We're a statistic this morning. We're part of that statistic. We're part of that unemployed here in the state of Alaska. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's just life. That's how it is. If we have to live within our means, then by God, government should have to live within their means. Yeah, Shelley's got that, – that's a great – uh, analysis that Shelley's done. I'm looking for your to her conversation with you in the next hour, um, and I don't want to I don't want to seal her thunder by by making her points early. But it's 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 a great analysis of uh, of 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 the operating budget. Basically, is what it comes down to. But Michael, we're going to hear we go into the, we're, we're going to go into the next session. Governor's going to come out with his budget this week. We're going to go into the next session, and we're going to hear the same thing we've heard over and over and over again. We're going to hear that we can't cut K through 12. We can't we can't cut the university anymore. The university's been cut to the bone. We're cutting into the bone. We can't cut the university anymore. We need construction jobs, so we need to have a capital budget. Uh, oil and gas, the oil and gas industry is going to start. They've already started the drumbeat again. Uh, that we need those exploration, those oil and gas tax credits paid off now, rather than according to the statutory. Uh, uh, timetable that's set out uh, in law. Uh, we're going to hear uh, the special interests uh, again come back and say, we can't cut here, we can't cut here, we can't cut here, we can't cut here. And all of that's going to add up to we can't cut anymore. And in fact, we need more revenue to you know to keep these basic <laughs> uh, basic services going. Right. And we've got a governor. This is the this is the thing. This is the thing where I've lost confidence in in Governor Walker. We've got a governor who's not looking out for the overall economy. He's looking out for government. He's been captured by by government and has become sort of their lobbyist in chief, uh, uh, arguing for. You know, we need more money for this. We need more money for that. We need more money for the other thing. We can't cut any more here instead of looking out for the overall economy and saying, look, yes, we understand that government plays a role in the economy, but it's not the only role in the economy. And, and we need to temper uh, government's uh, grab for additional revenues because we're taking, our, we're, we're taking those revenues now out of the private sector and we're having worse consequences by taking them out of the private sector than uh, than, than cutting in government. Government, and and we don't have a governor who's looking out for the overall economy. Right. We have a governor who's who's become the the government you know sector lobbyist in chief, and unfortunately, they and the legislature make the rules. So yes, Shelley uh, it has has it has a great analysis of of what we've done and what we haven't done in terms of government. But we're going to go back into this next session, and we're going to hear all these same themes again about you can't cut us, you can't cut K through 12, uh, you can't cut the university anymore, you've got to get the construction budget up, the capital budget up. We're going to hear all those sorts of things again. And uh, and and hopefully uh, we will at least hold our own through this session, but it, it's going to be a battle. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about what you just touched on, which is the schools. Harold in the uh, chat room is talking about, you know, what about the what about the formula funding? One point four billion dollars per year for failing schools. Uh, you know, let he and it, this has been something that Harold's been harping on for a long time. I know on the program, that's been one of the big things is we get locked into these formula funding scenarios where essentially we're mandated to pay X amount regardless of what's going on. And of course, whole situations in the state are very fluid and could change for year to year. Why should we lock ourselves into these formulas, which basically mandate that we pay certain things when we may not need them, or we may need something completely different. Yeah. I've got to chuckle because one of the biggest formula funding uh, uh, pieces in the, in the, uh, in the statutes is the PFD. Right. I mean, it's 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 a formula. <laughs> you take fifty percent. You take fifty percent. That's what the statute says. You take fifty percent of the earnings uh, average over the last five years of, of the of the permanent fund, uh, and you divide that by the number of eligible Alaskans, and you pay it out. That's the formula. <laughs> and the legislature didn't seem to have any qualms 
uh, legislature and governor didn't seem to have any qualms about cutting it. Right. Uh, so I, you know, it, it's yes, we need to go back and look at these at the formulas. The 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 K through 12 formula of the BSA hasn't been looked at since 2000. Hasn't been looked at in detail since 2008. I'm a little surprised, frankly, as we've gone through. Uh, the last couple of legislative sessions that somebody hasn't said, hey, let's go look at the BSA. Uh, it gives you an idea of how of how potent uh, the the lobbying force behind K through 12, uh, both the unions and the and the and the affiliated uh, uh, citizens groups, how potent they are that they that they prevented even a look at uh, the BSA formula. Uh, you look at Medicaid, uh, the the Medicaid formula uh, that we that we latched on to in this state and all of the optional services that we've agreed to. Um, we, we haven't really gone into that. The, the Senate said they did a study of that, uh, but frankly, what the Senate really did was try to figure out how to restructure uh, our Medicaid services, our Medicaid uh, uh, provide uh, the way in which we're providing Medicaid so that we could get more federal funding for it. It wasn't right. really a look at whether we need all these optional services and whether we can cut back on them. It was much more. Uh, uh, how do we get more? How do we make more of this uh, uh, funded by the feds as opposed to funded by the state? So right. it's we we haven't gone back into these formulas except for the PFD, which which they had no no problem cutting cutting uh, back right. by fifty percent. So well, like you said, I mean, here's a big formula that all of a sudden they have no problem cutting formulas, but if you cut any other formula, whoa, Katie bar the door. And Brad, a question I've been I've uh, been asked personally a lot, and also seen at Facebook quite a bit, is uh, has there been any talk from pretty really anybody um, about what about the allocation of the money that's been taken from the PFD? So, what do you mean by allocation, Eric? In terms of where it's going to be used in the budget in the future. Oh no, no! It there's it, no. I mean, it, it's been so. So really, so really, what's happened is the PFD's been cut. The money's been kept in the earnings reserve. The money that otherwise would have gone out, yeah, gone out in the PFD has been kept in the earnings reserve. But they've really spent that by drawing down the CBR further, uh, the constitutional budget reserve further, and and that and that money has gone all sorts of different places. It's gone to. Uh, keep the K through 12 funding at the at the at the formula level. Keep Medicaid going at all of the optional services. Um, uh, uh, keep some capital uh, uh, budget going. So it's it you can't dollar trace uh, what dollars have come out of the uh, out of the offset spending from the constitutional budget reserve. You can't you can't dollar trace those directly to to given areas. They're just sort of supporting. Supporting all of the spending that's going on in the budget. Yeah, okay, well, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, and that's part of the. I mean, I, I agree with Eric. I mean, that's really kind of the insult to injury when it's all said and done. Is they took this money out of the Alaska economy, damaging the economy, but they didn't even give us a half a turn on the money where government would spend it and we'd usually get half a turn out of it. They just left it sitting in the account. Now, as you said, they kind of counterspent out of the CBR, but that's the biggest part. Is that I mean, they're damaging the economy, and it just seems like. They don't care. It just seems like it, it's at any cost. We have to protect big government. They, they, they do. I mean, it, they do care in this sense. They care about those who, you know, respond to K through 12, the arguments from the K through 12. They, they, they care about K through 12. We've kept K through 12, you know, fully funded. Uh, those that are concerned about capital budgets. Well, we've kept some capital budget, some capital budget spending going. Those that are concerned about oil and gas tax credits, you know, by gosh, we got to spend on oil and gas tax credits. Right. Uh, you know, it's a bad thing we're not spending more on them. I, it's it's um, they care they care about their microcosms. They care about their micro share of the economy. Pet project. Nobody. Right? Yeah, nobody seems to care about the economy as a whole, the overall economy, and that's you know when you, when you're going through a recession, that's that's what you should be caring about. You shouldn't be you, you shouldn't be hyper focused on let's make sure K through 12 stays okay, or let's make sure, uh, which is essentially saying let's make sure local government stays okay, let's make sure the healthcare system stays, healthcare workers stay okay, let's make sure you know this microcosm. Stays okay. You ought to be worrying about the overall economy and whether the overall economy is staying okay. And we've got nobody, uh, nobody 
uh, who is who's expressing concern about the overall economy. At the at, at the end of the of, of last week's show, uh, you said you know you asked me what what can people be asking their legislators or asking legislative candidates uh, that sort of gives you an idea of how they feel about things. And my response then, and my response now would be ask them ask them what they think the the biggest issue is they're facing. And and if they say anything other than the overall economy, you've got a problem. If they say, oh, K through 12, or oh, oil gas tax credits, or oh, capital spending, or you've got a problem because they're they're thinking more about a microsm uh, than they are a microeconomic issue than they are about the macroeconomic issue of the overall economy. So we've got nobody doing that, and right. and in and in a in a recession, that's a bad thing. We're talking with Brad Keithley, who's with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. He's a former oil and gas consultant and attorney, now retired. And, of course, we focus on these issues with him every week here on the Michael Duke Show. Uh, if you're listening on Facebook, go ahead and share us out with your friends and let them know that Brad Keithley's on talking about some important stuff. And don't forget, you can pick up the audio-only stream at MichaelDukeShow.com. So if you're watching on Facebook and you got a jet and you can't watch anymore, you can still listen and take us with you wherever you go at MichaelDukeShow.com. But we appreciate you sharing us out on Facebook just so we can get some more buzz and some more word out there. Brad, you've mentioned a couple things, and I think the elephant in the room is about to drop on us. We were just talking about this the other day, uh, and, and lo and behold, this article comes up in Bloomberg talking about pension obligations. This literally is the 800-pound gorilla that's about to drop right in the middle of our chest. Uh, it's happening across the country. Uh, pension funds are, are eating different municipalities and state governments absolutely alive, and Alaska is no different. Let's talk a little bit about uh, what nobody's talking about, the Alaska Pers and Tours Pension Fund. <laughs> Yeah, I posted this uh, with a comment that said, you know, if you're if you're running out of things to worry about from Alaska's <laughs> fiscal perspective, try try this one on. Um, we we are uh, our our pension, our state pension obligations are getting worse now. You know, one of the things that Shelley talks about in her piece is is when you look at the, the at the high uh, the high spending level from which the governor's been calculating how much we've reduced it. One of the things in there was a three billion dollar uh, payment we made, essentially out of the CBR, well, directly out of the CBR into the pension reserve fund, in an effort to offset some of the attrition that we had that we had suffered in the in the preceding decade. Well, we're going backwards again. Uh, we're now, uh, according to the Bloomberg article, we're eight billion dollars uh, behind in funding uh, funding our pension funds. We have a pension. Uh, obligation that should uh, be at the rate or should be funded at about uh, uh, 21 billion dollars right now. We should have about 21 billion dollars to, to claim in our pension funds to claim that we're fully funded. We have about 13 in there right now. Three of which uh, was uh, was from the, the 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 contribution a few years ago, leaving the eight billion dollar gap. Uh, that ranks us what 14th in the nation in terms of. In terms of how bad off we are with our pension fund, uh, we're funded at about 62%. And part of part of the problem, well, a big part of the problem is we're going backwards. I mean, what the what the Bloomberg article shows is compared to uh, 2015 uh, when we were funded uh, when we were funded at 67%, we're now at 62%. Right. Even with that three three billion dollar injection, we're going backwards. That's for a couple of reasons that we can get into in a moment. But the big the big headline is we're going backwards on our pension. It's getting worse. It's not getting better. Well, and and I and I get a little worried because there's a lot of red on this map. When you look at this, uh, when you look at this map, and I'm going to go ahead and share the story out there onto Facebook uh, so that people could take a look at the at the map and the stories that we're talking about right now. But when you look at this map, there's a lot of pink and red, and pink and red means underfunded uh, 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 pension funds across the country. There are very very few green uh, uh, you know squares out there, meaning that they're funded enough to. To, to do it, and almost all of them have gone backwards. This is a trend, and Alaska, I mean, we're not trendsetters. We're following the trend, and this is going to spell uh, some real problems, not just for the state of Alaska, but for the country as a whole. Yeah, part, and part of the reason that we're going backwards, Michael, is that we are there, – there's a, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, but, but the principal one is we're not contributing 
on an annual basis enough to keep ourselves enough to keep ourselves whole enough even to you know stay at the 65 percent level uh, or 67 percent level that we were at a couple of years ago uh, we have cut back as part of as part of the cuts that we have made uh, the PFD cuts one of those we we've cut back on on pension contributions uh, frankly they've redone the formula uh, that they've been using on pension contributions to try to lengthen out the, pay, the, 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 the period of time over which we're going to make these contributions before we catch up to being fully funded. Um, and, and, the, and, and they've done that in order to reduce the annual payment uh, that's being made uh, out, of the, uh, uh, out, of, out of the operating budget. So uh, <laughs> one of the things they have done is made, has made our overall uh, situation worse by cutting back on that. The other thing they've done or the other thing we do is we, we assume an 8% uh, return on the funds that, are, that we put into the pension fund, that the pension fund will earn an 8% return. So all of the, all of the calculations are, are made based on the assumption that, uh, that the pension fund going forward will continue to earn an 8% return on average across all of the years that the pension fund's in place. Virtually no pension fund anymore and no endowment fund or other funds of that nature are using an assumed 8% return, they're all back down in the six range or so. So when you, when you, when you use a more realistic range, which is what Bloomberg has done here, uh, your, your obligation grows because you're not going to, you're not, you're not any longer assuming that your current pension fund is going to grow at the rate it used to. It's going to grow at a lower rate. So your, so your difference, the gap, uh, uh, expands. And so those, those two things have just are, 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 are making a slide backwards. We're not using a realistic return rate, and we've reduced the level of contributions we're making annually. To get back in shape, to get to move ourselves back toward um, uh, health uh, in, in the pension fund, we've got to increase uh, the amount of annual contributions that we're making out of the budget. And that either, may, that either, that either means we've got to cut back even more someplace else, or we are going to have to start grabbing more revenue out of the private sector in order to, in order to fund that. It's a, it's a it's a problem that's going to come back to haunt us in the same way it did in the early uh, 2010s when we realized uh, that uh, that we were significantly underfunded in the pension fund. Well, you, th- you think we would have learned from that? I mean, because I mean, again, that was a big, big uh, you know a, a bite to take. And as we looked at it and we saw how things went, you know, we made changes. We took it down to the tier four. Uh, you know, we changed it to a defined uh, to a defined contribution instead of a defined benefits. They did all the right things and made all the right moves, and they started paying it down. And then legislators, in their infinite wisdom, as the thing went down, went, well, we don't really need to spend the money on that, even though even though it had been it had been sussed out and inked out by. Uh, I think it was Mike Kelly that had put it all together and said, no, we've got to do this or this is going to kill us. And he'd actually put it all out and written it all out in a formula. And, you know, in their short sightedness, they decided, well, we won't just we just won't fund that for one more year. And then the next year, oh, we just won't fund that for one more year. Pretty soon you're talking about, well, eight billion dollars right now. Yeah, well, pretty soon back in the early 2010s, we were talking about we have to put three billion dollars in it. Just to sort of get it back up to you know something that's reasonably acceptable. Um, so I mean these these things take huge chunks of money uh, when you finally come to when you finally come to reality. And it's another way, frankly. I mean the way we're doing it now is another way of imposing a tax on future generations. The way that we have restructured these annual payments in the pension fund, they they increase over time, right? Um, so we we're paying sort of the bare minimum now to meet. You know, to, to meet the last test of whether we're you know, whether we're continuing to try to keep the pension fund going, um, and but but that increases over time. So the future generations are going to have to pay for the fact that we haven't been funding it now, and they're going to have to pay significantly additional significant additional amounts to do that, and that's going to come at the cost of either you know cutting back on spending elsewhere uh, or uh, taxes on on future generations. So it's we're getting, we're making the problem we're making the problem bad and we're making it worse in uh, with the mechanisms that we're using now yeah no i got to tell you it uh it, it you know this this idea this has been kind of the short-sightedness of our politicians for years in this state 
Um, and I don't know if it's just a, you know, part of a genetic makeup of the majority of people who decide to run for office. But this lack of long-term vision, it seems like they can always think 12 to 24 months down the road, but they look at their actions and they can't think of causality, you know, into the five, maybe 10-year mark. I mean, okay, we'll cut the spending to the, to the PERS and TERS balance this year, uh, but we'll just do it this one year. And it's never just this one year. It's always just, you know, something else is going to come up. And now, of course, we've got our crisis and everything else. And, and this will be the thing, even if we get our house in order now on the spending side of it, um, this will be something that if we don't take care of, will come back and really, really hurt us in the future. Yep. And I'll, and I'll say this. I mean, this will get people going. But um, it, it isn't just um, – taxpayers it isn't just those who contribute to uh the budget that should be concerned about this retirees alaska state retirees um uh think they are protected by a constitutional provision uh that, that we have a provision in the constitution that says uh we'll treat uh these pension obligations as contractual commitments and as a result they can't be you know can't be changed or altered uh, without the agreement of the other party. There's a case in, in the California working its way through the California courts right now that's really on that exact same issue. California, the California courts historically have interpreted their uh, uh, pension obligations to be the same, to be the same sort of contractual obligation. And and that's coming back to bite the state big time right now. <laughs> the governor of California, Jerry Jerry Brown, for all of the for all of the criticisms criticisms that, that, that many level against Jerry Brown. Brown, is, as the governor's office has intervened in that case and argued uh, that, no, there are, there are more important things uh, in government that are more important things uh, that need to be taken into account uh, in, 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 in dealing with pension obligations than simply you know, contractual commitments, commitments. The contractual commitments can be modified by government action. And in fact, they can. It's a, it's a decent legal argument. Right. Um, and so they're arguing that the pension obligations, the state's pension obligations, even though they're contractual commitments, can be cut back by state law. If that case were successful, uh, there are some differences between the California system and the Alaska system. But if that case were successful, that's going to be something that people in Alaska are going to look are going to be looking at, especially with an eight billion dollar shortfall in our pension funding. Yeah. So I'm Absolutely. I'm I'm here to tell you. That all you retirees, state retirees, who think you've got it made, who think you're protected by the constitutional provision, you aren't. Yeah. And you've got a stake in making sure that this pension system uh, is, is brought, back up to, brought back up to snuff as well. Well, and, uh, and, and, and I would argue that at some point uh, we might have to look at something like that, that we might have to look at those contractual things and understand that these defined benefits, which are, I mean, basically – several of these major defined benefits programs across the country have gone bankrupt and had to be bailed out by the federal government because they were just they were unsustainable based on how they were to begin with i mean g gm and delta they had to both be bailed out by the federal government there's been several municipalities and states that have had the same thing happen and and it's just it will bankrupt uh, you know, it's, it'll bankrupt an entity, and we've got to be paying attention to that. You mentioned California. I had to find it ironic that when you go to this Bloomberg chart, California has no data available because it would probably be the deepest blood red thing you had ever seen. I mean, they, I mean, I think the last thing I saw said it was something like $150 billion plus unfunded, I think, at one point. Yeah, it's a, it's a fairly – it's it's the monster that's eating their budget, and uh, and 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 so they're doing something about it, and it's not fully funding it. It's it's going back in and trying to make uh, trying to make adjustments to it. And I, you know, a lot of these states have made adjustments to their to their. Not all states treat them as contracts. A lot of states has made adjustments to the uh, have made adjustments to their pension plans. In fact, I think the article that I read was reading about about the California case said. Uh, almost every case, almost every case uh, that's involved cutbacks to public pension funds has been has been upheld by the courts. Right. Um, uh, just like just like there's an anticipation that the California case will be upheld. So you know you want so retirees. I guess the the long and short of it is retirees have a stake <clears throat> in reducing state spending in other areas also, because one of the ways we're dealing with that right now is we're short funding. 
the retirement fund. Right. And if that, you know, if we get to a point where where we have to blow that number up uh, in order to either pay the retirees or we have to take actions to cut back on the benefits, I, there's going to be a substantial movement to to, uh, to to reduce the benefits. So retirees have a stake. I mean, talk about another talk about another formula program. The contributions to the to the right. retirement fund or right. formula program, and it's, and it's been cut. Retirees have a stake in getting spending down in other areas, so we can so we can at least you know keep our keep treading water, keep our head above water uh, with respect to our contributions to the retirement system. Uh, Bill says in the chat room, so we're signing contracts with no intention of honoring them, or am I confused? And, and I would argue that, no, these politicians, when they sign those contracts, have every intention of honoring it. But, again, you're talking about contracts that will term out, you know, 30 and 40 years in the future. And these politicians are having a hard time thinking 30 and 40 months in the future. So they may have every intention of it. The problem is they're writing checks that their bodies can't cash in the long run. Yeah, they're writing IOUs. They're writing, they're writing IOUs that they're depending on. You know, Bill's children uh, right, exactly. uh, and your children to, to and your grandchildren uh, to make good on, and they may either a may not be able to or may not want to, uh, and and yeah, they will look for ways just like a corporation, just like President Trump when he was in the private sector. They'll look <laughs> for ways to get out of those commitments uh, if uh, if if they're no longer good for them. So. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. Today's today's politicians have quote every intention of, of following through on them, but they're writing IOUs that that depend on uh, depend on a lot of things breaking right uh, uh, to 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 be fulfilled. Well, that's that's betting on the that's betting on the best case if come scenario. That's you know my my adage has always been prepare for the worst and hope for the best, and that way you'll be prepared. And theirs is exactly the opposite. Prepare for the best. And avoid the worst, and it'll all be fine. And unfortunately, that never seems to work out. Brad Keithley, final thoughts here. How do we get this? How do we fix this? What do we need to do? Your thoughts as we wrap things up. We need to elect a governor, and we need to elect legislators that are concerned about the overall economy and are concerned about the long term. That's a, that's a tough thing to ask when a lot of the funding for these campaigns come from private come from special interests either on the labor side or on the on the corporate side uh, you know GCI wants well you can do whatever you want to but we need to maintain funding for for the telecoms for you know telecom subsidies that we have built into state law so it's a lot of things to ask for a candidate uh, to, to give priority to the overall economy uh, and to give priority to the long term but we but we need we need candidates that do that, and when we ask questions of candidates, when I ask questions of candidates who are coming to me for, for contributions, I'm asking, you know, tell me what your priority is, and the overall economy needs to be first on the list. It needs to be first on the list when, uh, when voters go to the voting booth as well. Yep. Uh, Brad, where can folks find out more about what you're doing and some of the things you're covering and everything else? Well, uh, a couple of places. Uh, I have a website, bgkeithley.com, where I bring a bunch of this stuff together. Uh, if you want a more simplistic format, you can look for Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets uh, on Facebook. Uh, those who are watching Facebook Live know how to use it, so just go to Alaskans <laughs> for Sustainable Budgets on Facebook and, uh, and find our stuff there. Brad Keithley, thank you so much, my friend, for coming in and joining us on this, your inaugural vi – well, actually, you were here yesterday, but your first inaugural interview uh, on the uh, on the live program uh, here on the series of tubes, uh, the interwebs. Uh, we appreciate it, Brad. Thanks for coming in and joining us, my friend. Thanks for having me, as always, Michael. Appreciate you. Appreciate you calling in.